in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up this week, the Limassol Theatre Art School premieres a musical theatre production of Frozen. So we try to give as many children as we can who are up to the role a chance to perform the roles. So this time we have two casts. The latest Eurobarometer shows that two things are of most concern to Cypriots. What we can see is a situation which is, uh, I mean, consolidates the feeling that for people in Europe as a whole, and in Cyprus in particular, unemployment and economic situation is number one priority. But what I think differentiates the situation now, and perhaps we can see that, and I, I dare guess, but we can see that perhaps in the next Eurobarometer, is the fact that things are actually happening. And a local NGO is offering free legal advice and representation to asylum seekers. As well as the financial situation here, these people want a future. It's, they want to be able to work and be able to set up a home for their families. They're not looking for handouts. And they see that the situation here makes it very difficult for long-term solutions. There's a musical theatre production and a premiere for Cyprus, I believe, coming up in February. It's all being done by the Limassol Theatre Art School, whose founder and artistic director is Lucy Origiu. Lucy, tell us about Frozen. Frozen is a, a premiere production. Obviously, it's very popular right now with the children. It's the most popular Disney movie, I think, animated movie. So we've decided to take the movie and put it on stage. Can you do that just like that? I mean, there must have been a, a script or something, or did you actually um, adapt actually it? We've actually adapted the script from the screen um, to stage. It's proved to be extremely difficult and quite ambitious. Um, we're excited at the prospect of putting on something that is a premiere, I believe. And the children are very excited, the members of the cast are very excited to be doing something that's new and original and unique. But it has been very, very difficult, yes. So for those who aren't familiar with the storyline, just a vague synopsis without spoiling it? Um, basically, it's about a kingdom and it's the fight for survival of the kingdom. We have two very famous characters in there, Anna and Elsa. And um, in overcoming the problems of the kingdom, the snow and the winter that has been beset upon it by Princess Elsa, Anna has to go on an amazing journey. And on that journey, she meets some hideous trolls, which are really quite funny, and a very funny snowman named Olaf. So we have lots of adventure on, on her way to saving the kingdom. And the cast, what sort of age group are we talking about here? Because it looks like, or sounds like, a, a big production. It is. We have children aged from five years old all, all the way through to 17. So there's quite a diverse range of ages within the cast members. But it's lovely to see the older members really taking care of the little ones at the rehearsals. We have very long hours, long, tiring rehearsals. But the older ones do tend to mother the little ones. So... It's a diverse range of ages within the cast. And singing, dancing, all of that? All of it. It's musical theatre. So, so that takes a lot of coordinating. When you select the cast, do you try and include all the members of the art school? Or no, it's by audition only. It's not possible. Um, theatre school is now quite large and we have a lot of children coming through our doors. So it's not possible to cast every child who would like to be in the show in it. We have two rounds of auditions. We have two casts this time. In previous shows, we've actually had three casts because our children are now very, very strong and great performers. So we try to give as many children as we can who are up to the role a chance to perform the roles. So this time we have two casts, and again we had to have audition for the chorus as well. So no, it isn't an automatic entry into the show, I'm afraid. But I hope that what the public will see is the most talented cast we can put on the stage. And the performances are happening? Um, we have an opening night on Thursday the 26th of February. And then we have um, a performance on Friday the 27th, two on Saturday and two on Sunday. And 6.30pm for the evening performance and Saturday and Sunday there's also a 3pm matinee. It is, yes, Rosie. And additional charity performances are going to be given too. Tell us about those. Yeah, um, we usually have one on the Saturday morning for children, disadvantaged children. And we will also have quite an exciting charity performance um, at a theatre in Limassol. And that's going to be sometime in April. So that's going to be arranged after we finish and when we close. 
And this, I presume, is all available online, so people can buy tickets online, can they? Yes, they, they can. In fact, we've had quite a lot of bookings already, so people need to get a move on. Uh, we've urged the families of the children involved to get a move on because we tend to sell out quickly. So, yes, please do book tickets. It's www.limassolarts.com and you can book your tickets there. And tickets are 10 euros for adults, just 5 euros for children. So visit www.limassolarts.com if you want to be in the audience for the first ever Frozen being performed in Cyprus. Lucy or you, break a leg. Thank you very much. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. The results of Eurobarometer 82 were presented this week and showed that many Cypriots are dissatisfied with both European and national institutions. But the EU Commission's representation head, George Markopouliodis, said that much was being done to address the issues. There's been the uh, proposal for the uh, Juncker package of 315 billion uh, euros uh, investments. There's been acceleration of the, or, on, on the work uh, to address uh, unemployment, and in particular youth unemployment in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, for those countries that are actually in the south of Europe, uh, this is extremely important because to, to a certain extent it is those countries that have taken the brunt of the, uh, economic, of, of the economic crisis in the sense that uh, uh, investments have been reduced dramatically between 2008 and 2014 in those countries. And this is why we see that there is a certain uh, distance of their citizens, which is quite understandable, with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, other, the other countries in, in the EU who are doing uh, better. Uh, so what I'm saying is that quite a lot of things have happened to address these fundamental issues. Uh, one thing that I was thinking to myself, not as a not more as a former statistician, is what was quite interesting with our, uh, with the Turkey Cypriot community, that the number one preoccupation is uh, different to the number one preoccupation in the other countries. Nevertheless, number two and number three is the same. So what I'm saying is unemployment and the economic situation is the same, but there you have also the problem of rising prices which you don't have in the rest of, in the rest of Europe. So it is, it is something which is interesting to, to, to note. So, to cut the long story short, I think that what we can see is a situation which is, uh, I mean, consolidates the feeling that pe for people in Europe as a whole, and in Cyprus in particular, unemployment and economic situation is number one priority. But what I think differentiates the situation now, and perhaps we can see that, and I, I dare guess, but we can see that perhaps in the next Eurobarometer, is the fact that things are actually happening. Uh, the other day, the European Commission uh, issued uh, its forecasts for the uh, Eurozone, and for the first time, after a very long time, we have modest, modest, but everywhere positive growth prospects for all 19 Euro, Euro members. So the situation, we hope, is, is changing, that there is some, some glimmer, there is some light at the end of, uh, of, of the tunnel in which we have been for a very long time, but, I mean, all this remains to be uh, solidified. But I, I, did, I, I hazard a guess that the Eurobarometer next time around is probably going to be, hopefully, is going to be slightly different than, than this time around. I'd like to know what the European Commission, and particularly each country's Commission representation, does with these figures. Does it affect policy making, what's the direct impact? I know it's useful to have the figures, but what effect does it have down the line on European citizens? Yes, it, 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 undoubtedly it does. I think all, all, all you know, the, the Commission as a whole, but in particular the, uh, you know, our, our political masters, the, the, the commissioners, so the president and, 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 and uh, his vice president and his commissioners take these things very seriously into account. And I think it basically confirms, and I, I go back to the program of President Juncker, uh, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his 10 points that he presented to the European Parliament, um, and also the initial actions that this European Commission uh, is, 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 putting into, uh, is putting in place, and uh, the legislation that is putting in music, uh, as I say, concerning the investments, concerning the fight uh, against unemployment and the structural measures but also things like immigration uh, and migration uh, that we, uh, we heard uh, is, is one of the preoccupations, you know, that we have, the European Commission has said 
it's going to uh, propose uh, a consolidated holistic approach on, uh, on, on migration uh, in the first six months of, uh, of this year. So the answer is yes, these things are taken seriously into, into account, but of course we must, we must also take in, in, into consideration the fact that we have a very different picture from one country of the EU to another. So you, it's not a question of finding the, 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 the common denominator only, it's a question of trying to see how you can address each individual uh, country's uh, preoccupations. So, but yes, they are taken into account. They're not. It's not just an academic exercise. It is something that uh, you know influences policy. And you know, you know, our humble role here, for example, uh, you know, it also influences our thinking for our actions to uh, for for, for uh, communication, uh, our actions to reach out to to the people. There's no point in you know if we have identified that the number one preoccupation is unemployment. Uh, employment opportunities, business creation, there's no point in going out and talking about different things than that. And this is what we have been doing in the representation, as hopefully people know, uh, for, the, for the last year, uh, year and a half, uh, you know, we're concentrating on, on trying to help secret citizens to understand uh, what opportunities uh, are coming from the structural funds of the EU, uh, how we can go about uh, setting up a business uh, and all this kind of stuff. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries where we found something we didn't know existed. In other news this week, the finance minister came out all guns blazing after the Eurogroup meeting on Monday. There's been a lot of populism among Cypriot politicians in the wake of the Greek election and a lot of people saying we need to do something similar and get out of the Memorandum of Understanding. But Haris Yorgiadis said we must get serious in Cyprus and finally decide what path to follow. He also went on to say that we must understand that we can't play political games with the economy and a country's prospects. As long as we refuse, he said, to speak or hear the truth and we resort to a known delusion, we will be digging our own grave. He warned that Cyprus must act seriously and responsibly or be prepared to face reality at some stage. Many of his remarks have come in for criticism from opposition MPs, but they are known for their populism, and we'll wait to see what happens to that law on the foreclosures. Former Pathos Mayor Savas Vergas and the head of the town Sewerage Board have been sentenced to six years in jail in connection with corruption charges relating to the construction of the town's sewerage system. It's a scandal that has rocked Pathos and caused a by-election for a brand new mayor. The presiding judge, Dora Socratus, said that the defendant's behaviour and actions had no justification or excuse apart from grief appropriation of money, abuse of authority and abuse of trust. At a press conference earlier this week in Limassol, the Animal Party and Limassol Police said that people involved in animal abuse cases must be accountable to justice. Dog fights are an issue that are under investigation, according to Limassol Police Chief Kipros Mikhailidis. He said that on orders from police headquarters, the police in Limassol have intensified their efforts to clamp down on animal abuse and neighbourhood policemen are going to be involved in the process as well as specially trained officers. 
Last week, a 64-year-old man was found guilty of killing his dog by tying it to a car and dragging it through the streets of Limassol on Christmas Day in 2013. He'll be sentenced on Friday. The head of the animal party, Kiriakos Kiriakou, said that the campaign is to continue and he urged the public not to hesitate to report incidents of animal abuse. He said that they wouldn't necessarily be involved in procedural issues because they can either complain anonymously at the citizens' hotline, which is the number 1460, or they could promote a complaint by third parties, such as animal welfare organisations. And according to a government announcement on Tuesday, all Cyprus Airways ticket holders have until February the 28th to either be refunded or make alternative travel arrangements. Those who don't exercise this right by the end of the month will not be able to make a claim, according to the announcement. Ticket holders are asked to contact either the Cyprus Tourism Organisation on 22691100 or any authorised travel agency. Cyprus Airways, of course, was grounded in January after the European Commission ruled that a state aid package was in violation of competition regulations. The company was ordered to return 65 million euros, which triggered the airline shutdown. And some good news on the environmental front. A controversial bill has been taken off the table after a letter was sent by the Interior Ministry's Permanent Secretary to Parliament. Now, not all the provisions of the bill, which originally aimed at correcting chronic mismanagement of the beaches, were met with scepticism. But there was a provision that defined real estate to include marine space. And besides converting the seashore into real estate, the bill also allowed the Interior Minister to issue planning permits without a permit application being filed. So this is seen as a welcome reprieve for the coastline of Cyprus. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Earlier this week, the Humanitarian Affairs Unit of the Future World Centre expanded its services that it's been offering for several years now in support of asylum seekers and refugees who are looking for international protection. With me on the Cyprus News Digest this week from the Future World Centre, I have Corina Drusciotto, who is head of that Humanitarian Affairs Unit. Corina, what exactly is this service you're offering? Because you have been helping asylum seekers, I think, for six or seven years or more. Yes, our organisation has been assisting refugees since uh, 2006, uh, mainly on a UNHCR funded project, uh, which has been ongoing since 2006. And uh, then along with that project, we also have uh, other funds that um, enlarge our capacity uh, in order to offer better services. We offer legal, uh, social support, as well as recently psychological support to asylum seekers, and as well as refugees who enjoy international protection. A lot of people would say these are things that should be covered by government welfare departments. Yes, there's certain, uh, th this is actually our, uh, why we, the, these projects exist, because they actually come to fill in a gap that exists in the asylum uh, system. In other countries, especially the legal um, support part, is offered in way of legal aid uh, provided by the state. In Cyprus, unfortunately, it's limited only to the very final stage, which is the Supreme Court stage, and not the earlier stages of examination. A lot of people would also say, though, that it's at the earlier stages of examination that these people need support, help, and some way of understanding how the system works. Yeah. Definitely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, first of all, it's a very complicated legal procedure, which is very difficult for anyone to, to, to understand and to cope with. Most of refugees feel quite overwhelmed with it. Uh, when arriving to a new country. In addition, from a legal point of view, it's extremely important to have assistance from the early stages because that is actually when the substantial examination is, is taking place. Most cases, uh, an interview will only be provided in the very first stage. After that, it's up to the discretion of the authorities whether they will provide subsequent uh, interviews. And in most cases, it doesn't happen. So by the time you get to the Supreme Court stage, which only examines points of law anyhow, it will not 
examine if this person is a refugee, but only if the legal procedure was followed properly. What the Supreme Court will have before them may not be sufficient to actually acknowledge whether this is a well-founded case or not. So we provide assistance from, from day one, from access to the procedure. If you don't access the actual procedure, then you can't access your rights, you, you, you're not part of the system. So we start even from the step before someone becomes registered as an asylum seeker. For us, once someone voices their wish to apply for uh, international protection, that's where our assistance begins. Now, th what's the expansion of this system? You now, I think, with funding from the EU, are going to have, what, two more lawyers available? What are yes. they going to do? Well, the, the European Refugee Fund is uh, an EU-level fund which um, comes through the government. So there is the solidarity, uh, the solid it's called the Solidarity Funds Department of the government that uh, administrates uh, such funds. The actual fund used to be 75% provided by the EU and 25% by um, the Republic. Due to the financial crisis in all countries that are facing uh, a financial crisis in recent years, it's been um, shifted to 95 to 5%. So it's, it's a lot of funding coming from the EU, which also creates jobs. Uh, it's provided uh, for two young lawyers, uh, for administrators. So there's also a secondary benefit for uh, the community. But the, this will only run until summer. This is the problem. Unfortunately, these projects up till now have been administrated in a way uh, very short term which, as you can understand, hinders the continuity, it builds up capacity, and then it uh, breaks down and everything that's been built up. But it's better than nothing. So we, we have our uh, core capacity, and then these funds come to add on. So with the two new lawyers, it means we get to more people. It means we're able to assist more cases. How many cases do you get, let's say, every week or every month? I would say uh, we will be usually counted on a six-month basis. We get about 400 to 500 new cases every six months, and that's not counting the existing cases. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, newcomers in Cyprus. It could be people who are facing problems who have already been here or whose case has been rejected and they want to um, appeal. appeal especially with the with the Syrian conflict now going on. What has happened is that the number of asylum seekers in Cyprus has definitely dropped, but uh, the well-founded cases have risen. So where in the past many cases would come through and they wouldn't have very um, good grounds, which would mean less work for us. But now with the Syrian cases, everybody is a refugee. Everyone from Syria is undoubtedly a refugee. But a lot of them are not acknowledged as such when they first arrive. I mean, they have huge problems, don't they? And what about the huge number of Syrians we already have in the country who have been given, I think, the protected status but not full recognition as a refugee when it's very obvious that as long as this conflict goes on in Syria, they can't possibly be sent back? Yeah, well, just to clarify, first of all, there's no returns of Syrians by the Cyprus government, um, and that's been ongoing for over two years. So the Cyprus government is acknowledging that it's a very serious situation. However, the conditions in Cyprus, and as you said, this limited status that they're receiving, it's called subsidiary protection, which doesn't afford them full rights, is acting as a deterrent. And we saw that with the boat arrival where people were rescued in the sea and yet up to this day they insist that they don't want to apply. And they're quite justified to do that because with this status they don't have a right to family reunification. So uh, mostly uh, the male member of the uh, family will travel and then try to pull the rest of the family. So you have fathers here who have little kids in Syria and their wives and they're told that if you get the status, well, you can't bring them. So uh, f for us that's completely inhumane. As well as the financial situation here, these people want a future. It's, they want to be able to work and be able to set up a home for their families. They're not looking for handouts. And they see that the situation here makes it very difficult for long-term solutions. And with subsidiary protection, they're not allowed to work? No, they're allowed to work. That goes more to the financial situation of Cyprus, realizing uh, that it's not going to be so easy to, to find jobs and to, to integrate as well as the lack of integration, uh, there's a complete lack of integration policies in Cyprus and programs. So the day after of actually being recognized now has become harder than when you were an asylum seeker. And let me just clarify, we don't have a large number of Syrians. 
And this is why we don't have a large number of Syrians. We should have and we could have, but we don't. There is this misconception, I think, in the public's mind that we have thousands and thousands, and we don't. We, we, we have maybe reached in 2,000. And when we think of the millions, I mean, it's now reached probably 5 million Syrians have left Syria, and we only have about 2,000. But that's We're because the, the government's policy that. has been to only yeah. offer subsidiary protection as a deterrent, isn't it? That as well as other policies have, have definitely acted as a deterrent, yeah. You meet people, I mean, before we started talking about this, Karina, you said that a lot of Cypriots don't know about the Future World Centre and this work that mm -hmm. you're doing. What reaction do you get from Cypriots when they find out? Because there is, I think, it's not unfair to say, quite a lot of possibly even aggression towards people coming and asking for asylum here. People say they're taking our jobs, why should we pay for them and so on. There is a lot of antipathy, let's say. Um, yes, I think it, especially in the recent past, it was used uh, during the previous government. It was the issue of asylum seekers, and then we had a lot of misleading information come in from the media on the benefits and, and, and of that, which caused a very negative stance towards uh, asylum seekers. But actually, our experience when working uh, directly with people in the community is that they are much more understanding and there's much more humanitarian feeling out there than what is uh, appears either um, in the media or over social networks. You know, the haters tend to be the ones who will express themselves more and, and more medium people will, will actually, uh, unfortunately, remain silent. And that's not just on this issue, but many, many others. There is a lot of misinformation, as I said, with the numbers. So, so when you explain, I, I've noticed when you tend to explain to people that you, we're not talking about huge numbers, we are talking about uh, numbers that are, uh, can be managed. I mean, we're talking about 3,000 recognized as well as subsidiary protection refugees in the country. 3,000 is not a problem. 3,000 is just a matter of management. But uh, it's also something, I think, that 3,000 could contribute significantly to the growth of our economy if they were given free reign to do so. Definitely. Uh, definitely. And they did in, in the past, which is something that has been completely ignored. We forget that most of the working force, which included refugees as well in the past, were non-Cypriots. So the, the great Cypriot success boom that we all lived in recent years was contributed by non-Cypriots, and, and, and it is you know good to remember. So we do have short-term memory as, as a society, and it always shocks me that uh, as a country that's gone through a war, has gone, has, has refugees, and that we, we, we forget, we tend to forget, and uh, especially from the authority side, there should be a more humane approach. Well, you're certainly helping towards that. That is Corina Drusciotto, head of the Humanitarian Affairs Unit of the Future World Centre. And you'll find them online, and apparently you can also get in touch with them on double two eight seven three eight two zero. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.